Why do women got to be able to go through? Why did Proverbs 31 woman have to do everything? Why is it that a woman has to be able to be up and down and level and balance? But then she has to have emotion. But then she has to be able to think straight. Then she has to have wisdom. Why? Because the rib was the part of the body that if the only bones that go in and out. A rib opens up and closes so that you can breathe. So even a rib is a life giver. Because the very essence of your ribs expand and contract so that you can breathe. That says to me that God has made us flexible. That says to me that God has created me in a way where I need to be able to take it in and take it out. I need to be able to move when he says move and be still when he says be still. Because my moving and my being still is vital to something. Survival. And those ribs, they can, when you're trying to take in a breath or out a breath, they can't, they can't stay locked up when they're supposed to be out of and they can't stay out when they're supposed to be in. Jesus. And that's what God made you from. He was saying, in other words, I, I already put all of this right here. If y'all would just read it and understand it. You will understand how you were created to operate in the way that is frustrating you right now. But it's really the way he designed you. And the word Eve, the very word Eve, comes from the word giver of life. We know that the Bible says Adam looked at his wife and called her Eve because she was the mother of all living. I want to challenge you all to understand that it just didn't mean she was the, the, the first natural mother. But even by right of understanding what we said about the real, she was designed to be a life giver. Meaning that she was designed to release life and not death. So we got we to gotta get this thing because she was put in a unique place of influence. She was made delicately but she was made to give life. Sometimes giving life is not patting somebody on the back. Baby, everything's going to be all right. Sometimes giving life is saying that right there, that's not of God. I know how you're feeling. That's not of God. Sometimes it's not saying, baby, you know, you're going to be okay. You're going you gonna to do better next time. No, sometimes it's saying, I don't want no computer on when you get home. I want you in the book. I want you reading. Uh-uh, we ain't doing that today. I don't feel like, no, you ain't going there today. Life giving does not mean babying. Mm -hmm. So, so embrace that there are two sides to you, and it's a reason. Mm -hmm. Just you just gotta know when to use them. Mm. Mm. Let me say this about this reading, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on. <laughs> and I've shared this before. I don't think it's in the book, but I've shared it because I keep doing more research on the reader. The reader. Interestingly enough, the rib, while it's the protector of all the vital organs, the rib is the very thing that if it's knocked off course, it can mm -hmm. penetrate the vital organs. Yes. So it not only can protect them, but it can destroy them, just like that. Which says that if we came from a rib, and we originated, our, our, the fabric of how God created us was from this rib, so he's saying something to us. If we operate broken, the very thing that we're supposed to be protecting, we're bringing damage to it. The very thing that we were put in place and wrapped around, if we're broken and we don't get ourselves together and, and get what we need to be, we're bringing damage to the very thing that we were called to protect. So much responsibility with being a woman. One of the other things that's interesting, and I think it, it, it's, it's very interesting, is that there's a disease called bifurcated rib disorder. It's not really a disease. It so much feels like pneumonia that it can be misdiagnosed as pneumonia. But bifurcated rib disorder can kill you. One of the things that I believe God is tired of is for us disguising ourselves as if we have it all together. And every time we, I, I'm just going to keep it real. I think one of the best things about the ministry that God has called me to is the authenticity. I'm not standing before anybody trying to act like I got it all together. And from Genesis to Revelation, I know everything in between. Because the reality is I don't have time to pretend. That's right. Because the minute that we start pretending Amen. is the minute that that thing sneaks up on us and take us down. With bifurcated rib disorder, it can be looked at on an x-ray. And, 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 and it cannot be detected. Like pneumonia, you can look on x-ray, you can see the fluid in the lungs, it can be detected. So we have to be careful that we don't pretend. We have to be careful that we don't pretend that we're in place, pretend that we're not broken, and then we're broken and we're bringing, we're bringing death to the things around us. 
So it's important for us to recognize that we're life givers. That we've been put in a place to give life and to wrap around the things that are dear to God. One of the things that I, I put in my notes is when you consider the issue of us understanding our destiny and our, and our identity and walking in our destiny and our design, it's not really that we have issues with accepting what God has called us. The issue sometimes is that we don't, we're not healed. Sometimes we're still taking the baggage of the things that the enemy threw at us to try to distort our purpose or hijack our destiny, and we're still carrying bits and pieces of that. And that's what God wants to break off. Yeah. Um, the enemy is not, the enemy knows with some of us that, they, that the bottom line is he's not going to be able to destroy us. But he says, if I can just get in there a little bit and cause a little bit of confusion, I won't get her all the way over here, but if I can just get her over here, I still did something. Because over here, God knows this is the fullness of your potential. This is the fullness of the manifestation of this plan for your life. So, okay, I'm not right here anymore, but I'm right here. Right there is not enough. Because that's not the per right there is not the perfect will of God. It's the permissive will of God. I'm letting you stay right there, and I'm not killing you. But over here is where I called you. So that little in the middle stuff, we can't walk in that. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta get where God wants us to be because we're women of influence. We're designed for a destiny, and we're made delicately. We're made with dominion, and then I want to get into some other things about how we're made. See, let me just go here for a brief moment. It was when Eve entertained the notions and the ideas of Satan that she got off track. Eve was not off track. Eve was created perfect, and Adam was created perfect. Let me make sure we we we, we stay grounded here. God created them. He said, behold, everything I made is good. It's perfect. It's able to function and do what it was designed to do. The issue came when Eve began to get into a dialogue with the enemy. She began to talk back and forth with the enemy. And see, sometimes us talking back and forth with the enemy is us talking back and forth with ourselves. Because sometimes yourself is what's doubting. Yourself is what's not believing. Sister Janet said, if we would just believe, sometimes yourself, you're standing there and you're telling yourself you can't do something. When she began a dialogue with the enemy, that is when everything shifted. I like to answer this question. How did she, how did she even get into a dialogue with the enemy? Right. We see the little retarded pictures painted with a big snake hanging out of a tree. Ridiculous. Would you have talked to a snake hanging out of a tree with a mouth and vocal cords? I wouldn't have. And I don't believe he coming like that right now. I don't believe he came like that because the Bible said he was cursed to the ground. So he didn't start on the ground. So I'm thinking it had to be something that was very interesting that kind of pulled her in. That kind of looked like something that looked normal. It looked like it could have been alright. Even Adam and Eve are not done. It fit into the scheme of things. See, and, and what, I believe, what I believe about that is it says that the Bible says he's the most subtle and crafty beast of the field. Mm -hmm. The most subtle and crafty. So I'm saying that to say the enemy is not coming at you any kind of way. Mm -hmm. How did the enemy roll up on me? My, this, this is what I propose. Because you see the communication between Adam and Eve was very limited. Mm -hmm. And I think if it was so deep, it would have been more in there to indicate that. Uh -huh. And some kind of way this thing rolled up on Eve at a time that she needed to communicate. You women know, single and married. Communication, if that's not the big thing, the big topic of every marital discussion, the big topic of every single discussion, engaged discussion, communication, communication. I just need somebody to communicate. Got to be able to communicate. I think we're going to talk so much about communication, we're going to miss it. The Lord been checking me about some things that I have made highlights, and he said, hey. Don't make something too high. Because while you while you up on the communication, somebody might, might not be able to cover you spiritually worth jack. So we gotta be careful. But the enemy rolled up on her how because he detected something. The enemy one came up to her for one reason only. And we said it last month, because she had the influence. He didn't come to her because she was weak. Why would I need to mess with a weakling? A weakling is gonna mess over themselves after a while. I came up on her because she has the influence. If I can hijack her, I got him, I got the children, I got it all. And if you really follow this story all the way to Genesis, the fourth chapter, you'll find out he hijacked the children. Why? Because he hijacked her. So he didn't have to worry about the children or Adam. Why? Because 
we're very good. Why? Because we've been called to wrap around and protect. So if I can get you, I got everybody. See, the, the devices of the enemy, we have to be careful. But he detected something. Can I be very transparent? I asked God, well, how is it that I ended up in eight months with an engagement ring on my finger? I had the audacity to put it on Facebook and celebrate. I had the audacity to sit before three pastors and then had to get a wake-up call after fasting for 30 days to be ready to throw that ring in the mailbox, all 4.5 carats of it. How? Because the enemy detected something. How did he detect it? He knew what the scenario was in your life. The Bible says that he's like a roaring lion, roaming about and seeking whom he, to, he can devour. The minute we think that we're above him and his strategies, so we got victory, but the minute we think he can't touch us is the minute he, did, he will destroy us. And I said, God, how? And the Lord took me back to my very own words and my very own book and my very own, because he saw a connected point. I see some issues here. I see some loss, some grief. I see some things in your life. And I think if I slide in now, you might not even see me coming. Mm -hmm. Ladies, we got to be careful. Because I want to throw these out here. You can jot them down fast. We're going to have a whole session on these. But I'm not going to stay here today. But he came up even. This is what he threw at Eve. I call them the, it grows every time. It started out five these, then it became six. Now it's seven or eight. I think I preached it one time. It was nine. But these are the what I call the deeds to every defeat. And these are found in Genesis 3, 1 through 7. We're not going to go there today. But the first one is detection. Again, I said the enemy rolls up on you and he sees something. That's detection. The next one is dialogue. He lures you into a dialogue with him. If we want to throw another deal there, we can call it a diabolical dialogue. <laughs> And then out of that dialogue, there's the one thing that he wants to get out of that dialogue. He don't have no goal right then to destroy you or anything. He just wants to plant one other deed, and that's make you doubt. Yeah. If I walk away from this dialogue and I made you doubt, that's all I needed to do. Because the Bible says that you either got to know or you can't know. You can't be doubting because the Bible says that a man who doubts is like he's unstable in all of his ways. And the Bible takes a step further and says he can't even expect to receive anything from God. And then the next one, once you doubt it, is deception. The minute I doubt one thing, they get, they have one instruction. Don't touch that tree. With everything, all the other trees, mm. one instruction. But the minute I make you doubt, I planted the idea that you might be able to touch it and get away with it. Even though God said, I'm going to kill you if you do it. I'm going to dismantle your whole life. You're going to drop dead in this garden. But some kind of way, after getting in that dialogue, being deceived and doubting, now, I, I'm deceived. So you have detection, I'm sorry, dialogue, doubt, deception. 